my name is Matthew W. Kent. I'm the author of Harbor Defenses of San Francisco Field Guide, 1890 to 1950. Today I'm inside BC Battery Townsley here atop of Wolf Ridge. Uh, these observation posts were subject of a YouTube video uh, a couple years ago, and we're actually going to be up here filming today exploring all five distinct observation posts that comprise the Wolf Ridge Complex. Uh, BC standing for Battery Commander Station. This is the Battery Commander Station for Battery Townsley. Uh, it was built and completed in 1940 and actually transferred to the Coast Artillery Corps on July 24, 1940. Uh, this station would have a complement of two personnel at all, at all times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you had a commanding view all the way from Bolinas up in the north, all the way down to Point San Pedro in the south. And this is one of uh, eight stations for Battery Townsley and with the uh, massive uh, baselines for the 16-inch guns, you have eight stations from uh, here, just above Battery Towns, we go all the way up to the north, uh, below Point Reyes, and all the way down south to uh, Pilbara Point. Uh, this particular facility was uh, built for observation and spotting capabilities. Uh, obviously, with the azimuth instrument and the DPF, uh, they were able to go ahead and track ships and do target acquisition. You can also see uh, remnants of some of the original Dobson Point information. The height of the station is actually 603 feet above sea level. Uh, we're looking at a uh, concrete reinforced structure throughout the entire complex here. Uh, still shutters in the uh, embrasure, in the uh, viewing aperture here. And uh, we also have uh, a 19 foot by 20 foot rear operations center for the battery commander. And this, was, this part of the facility was actually built and completed after the frontal portion. And we can still see uh, remnants of uh, the hooks for the uh, bunks for the personnel that would have been stationed here. You would have eight personnel back here, two up in the front, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And once again, this is the Battery Commander Station for uh, Battery Townsley. So just a little info about what these structures are not. Uh, there's a common misconception that this is actually a uh, defensive uh, position. There was no such armament uh, in these facilities whatsoever. The only armament would be uh, sidearms or arms that were brought in by the uh, individual soldiers remaining in the station. Uh, therefore, there's no defensive uh, capability uh, present here at the station, not like an Atlantic Wall facility in Normandy or something like that we find in France, uh, World War II for the Atlantic Wall. Uh, there's also a common misconception that uh, these posts contain Gatling guns. There's no such thing. Once again, these were observation and spotting stations. Uh, BC standing for Battery Commander Station. So what's really unique about these structures, uh, since we're on the west coast, these are of the dug-in type, whereas the Gulf Coast and uh, areas along the east coast, you'd have uh, raised towers for the uh, observation spotting capabilities. Uh, that was really the height requirements, obviously, were required for the uh, spotting uh, equipment that was uh, placed here. You needed to have uh, be up on a, a cliff or high up to go ahead and do any spotting or target acquisition. So therefore, the majority of the stations on the West Coast are obviously of a dug-in type. And uh, BC Battery Townsley obviously being a, a dug-in type. Uh, the only protection that was afforded by this facility was obviously the reinforced concrete that was poured into the structure. Overhead protection was provided with two to five feet worth of uh, Earth backfill. Uh, majority of the stations up on Wolf Ridge actually comprise of concrete, uh, reinforced concrete, whereas there's only one station uh, up here on Wolf Ridge that uh, actually has a one inch thick steel dome. And we'll be going to check that out in a little bit. Entrance was gained to the station via this manhole with the uh, steel rungs here. Uh, and the top of the manhole would be a hatch that would be locked once personnel were uh, stationed inside. You could put the station on lockdown. 
so they'll be able to come inside. Um, and this pretty much concludes uh, BC Battery Townsley, and we're going to be making our way now over to B1S1 Battery Townsley. We're now inside B1S1 Battery Townsley, uh, 663 feet above sea level, uh, directly above uh, the BC Battery Townsley here at Wolf Ridge. And uh, again, uh, dug in type uh, concrete reinforced structure. Uh, this was actually built and completed and transferred to the Coast Artillery Corps November 14th of 1941. Uh, what's really unique about the station is there's still some remnants of the Don Point information. You can barely make out the stencil here. Usually they used to say Muscle Rock, which is being down to the south. And again, we have a commanding view here of all the way down south from Point San Pedro, going way all, the way all the way up north to uh, Bolinas. And you had a complement of uh, two personnel here at all times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, standard issue equipment package here for the station. We have a uh, base for a depression position fighter and a pipe pedestal for a azimuth instrument. Um, and again, access was gained through the manhole here down the rungs. And again, there'll be a hatch up top. Steel hatch, you're able to lock yourself in. Uh, and again, this is manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, for uh, Battery Townsley. Uh, and again, everything up here is on Wolf Ridge uh, with a uh, rather commanding view of the entire area here, almost 600 feet above sea level. Um, so now we're going to be going ahead and going down the hill and making our way down to GB1. So one of the side note here, what's really interesting with these uh, some of these facilities up here on Wolf Ridge, you can actually see the uh, sort of remnants of the rocks on the facade here that were placed to try to camouflage the uh, insulation from a seaward view. So we have actual rocks over here that are used for camouflage on the facade on the left hand side, and we also have some remnants of rocks on the roof for camouflage, and also. Off to the right hand side, we can still see some uh, remnants of the uh, rock camouflage as well. And this was also in front of uh, BC Battery Townsley, and it's actually sliding down the hill, so it's just in the slide area. So we're going to go ahead now and make our way down to GB1. So as we're making our way down to the GB1 station, we can see the facade of BC Battery Townsley and the massive slide area that's encompassing this entire complex. Uh, this whole area started to slide in the El Nino storms in 1982, and this entire hillside is making its way down to Tennessee Cove. So you can see actually the remnants of the rock camouflage facade for the BC Battery Townsley station is actually detached from the station and making its way down the hill. So at this point we're going to go ahead and make our way through this wash over to GB1.
We are now inside GB1 here on top of Wolf Ridge, 588 feet above sea level, directly below B1 S1 Battery Townsleep. Uh, again, this is a dug-in reinforced concrete station with the added bonus of having a one-inch thick steel dome, which is the only steel dome station on top of Wolf Ridge. Uh, this was actually built and completed and transferred to the Coast Artillery Corps November 14, 1941. And what's really unique about the station is that we have the uh, manhole entrance right here with an attack hatch in the hatchway and the actual uh, entry ladder here, which is very, very unique. Uh, these are very hard to find within the system. Most of them are removed. We can look on the back wall here, we can see the uh, identification stencil for the uh, observation post here being group one. And we can see the standard setup for a compression position finder. We can see the concrete base here. And there would have been a azimuth instrument on a tripod over here. And also what's really unique about the station is that we still have the original cork insulation on the steel dome and there's actually an intact vision slit I'm not sure exactly how you call it vision slit aperture visor armored visor is still here uh, and this is actually operate on counterweights you can see the assembly right here and this would have been connected to obviously to a counterweight with a spring in order to go ahead and open and close the vision aperture directly over here. Uh, what's also unique about the station is that there's a command and control element in the very back, which would have housed 18 people 24 hours a day, seven days a week for uh, group one. Now, if we make our way to the back, and you can see the entire station is on a slant. This entire complex is sliding down the hill towards Tennessee Cove. Uh, we have uh, the original gas first quarters, one on each side, that still operate. You also see remnants of the uh, asbestos insulation tile, uh, pretty sure that has asbestos in it. And we can also see individual boots on either flanking either side of the station. And personnel would have been stationed in these booths relaying information back to their respective batteries within the groupment. Again, 18 personnel in the back here. This is all one solid station underground. Uh, the front of the station was afforded with obviously reinforced concrete, the entire facility, one inch thick steel dome, and we're protected overhead with two to five feet worth of earth backfill. And again, this has to be one of my more favorite stations just because of the sheer magnitude of being a steel dome station, obviously another dug-in type, and we have the operations room here in the back. And what we're gonna go ahead and do now is make our way down to the observation station for Battery Davis. And again, these are all in a massive slide area. This whole area started sliding around 1982 in the big El Nino storm. Uh, so we can also see here, you can see remnants of the uh, cabling for the station that is also still here. And we can make our way out to the dug-in entrance. Steel access door. And this is actually the uh, dug-in entranceway to the station here. Uh, this would be the actual entranceway for personnel to go ahead and enter. And if we make our way up the steps, there's still remnants of uh, the uh, wood timbering that covered the entranceway, uh, the dug-in portion of the station here for the entranceway. Uh, some of these are still intact. The majority of them going towards the entranceway here have actually uh, fallen down. So this would have been uh, Covered over with the uh, timbers and uh, camouflage with two to five feet worth of earth backfill. So 
So we've now made our way to the front of the GB1 station and we can see the massive amount of erosion that's occurred uh, here at this location. So this whole hillside is uh, sliding down towards Tennessee Cove. Uh, with the facade here, you can see the uh, monolithic pour of the concrete. Uh, it's indicated by the uh, lack of concrete underneath the base uh, of the station here. And you can see all the loose dirt as this whole thing is uh, becoming detached and eventually will make its way down the hill. Uh, so at this point, we're gonna, we have uh, two more stations to go ahead and take a look at, and we're gonna be ma making our way down to uh, the observation post down the hill here for Battery Davis. As we've now made our way down the slide area here at Wolf Ridge, we have now uh, made our way to stop number four out of five. We're now in front of B4S4 Battery Davis. And this is a dug-in type observation and spotting station uh, built and completed and transferred to the Coast Artillery Corps on November 14th, 1941. And we're actually 537 feet above sea level. Uh, this station is in extremely bad shape uh, due to the nature of the slide area here. Uh, standard equipment uh, would have been present inside the station. We can see a uh, pier for a uh, azimuth instrument and along the left hand side on the bottom is a base for a depression position finder. Uh, again the complimented personnel would have been two people here at all times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and this was one station out of nine for Battery Davis, and the stations would have been located up and down the coast, north and south of Fort Funston. And uh, due to the uh, candid nature of the station here, the amount of uh, poison oak in the area, we're actually not going to go in. And of note, with uh, most of the stations here at Wolf Ridge, we can still see the uh, remnants of the rock facade that would have camouflaged the station from seaward view. Um, and we can see it over here on the left-hand side. There's nothing on the right-hand side. Um, we're going to go ahead and make our way over to the uh, observation and spotting station for Battery 129. So finally we've made our way down to our final destination on our trip today here at Wolf Ridge. We're at site number 5 of 5, B1S1 Battery 129. Again, a dug-in, fully concrete, reinforced concrete facility. Uh, this was built and completed and transferred to the Coast Artillery Corps on October 23rd, 1943. Uh, standard equipment allotment as well. You have a pier for an azimuth instrument along with a base for a DPF, a dead, uh, depression position fighter. And uh, what's really unique about the station, instead of having a vision slit, uh, the station actually had individual armored shutters that would open and close for, uh, for viewing from the personnel. Again, this station would have had two people, station 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and we could also really see the monolithic nature of the uh, core here for the concrete. This whole area is on the slide, and we can see the entire base of the station is completely candid. So the base would have been poured with one pour, and the rest of the station would have been built around the base. Uh, also of note, it still has a original armor door, uh, the dug in portion to the station. Uh, Battery 129 was uh, actually never armed or completed. It was uh, deferred after the Japanese defeat at uh, Midway in 1942. So these stations were actually built but never used. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to uh, thank Jason Farrell for uh, all his help with his film today. 
And uh, if you're looking for more information on the Harbor Defenses of San Francisco, uh, please go ahead and look for my book at blurb.com, Harbor Defenses of the San Francisco Field Guide, 1890 to 1950. Once again, my name is Matthew W. Kent, and I hope you enjoyed this video.